Hi there. So, have I sparked your curiosity? Great. In this video, we start our irrationality proof for pi with some simple geometry in the unit circle to find expressions for the sine and cosine of an angle. This is a worthwhile goal in itself, so we can understand how our calculators and computers do their job. Pick a point, any point, on the unit circle at an angle x from the horizontal axis. The point's coordinates are then cosine of x and sine of x. Now we ask, how do these values change when x changes by a small amount? Let's call it h. So the point moves a little bit further along the unit circle. As drawn here, the cosine will get a little bit smaller and the sine will increase a little bit. If you look carefully and compare the angles, the small triangle at the top turns out to be similar to the big triangle on the bottom. It is simply scaled down by a factor of h. So the lower leg has length h times sine of x, and the left leg is h times cosine of x. Therefore we can write sine of x plus h is approximately sine of x plus h times cosine of x, and the cosine of x plus h is approximately cosine of x minus h times sine of x. The approximative nature stems from the fact that, strictly speaking, the small hypotenuse h is curved, not straight. But this error becomes increasingly small as h is chosen smaller and smaller. The study of how small changes in one quantity affect changes in another is the core idea of calculus hidden beneath layers of strange notation. It might appear sketchy and imprecise, but can be made mathematically exact. But for our goal, this would be more bookkeeping than enlightening. Okay, it is now time to set up a first draft for our formula for the sine. It will be some combination of the functions x, x cubed, x to the fifth, and so forth for all odd powers of x. This is maybe not the most obvious step if you have never seen a power series, but one way of making it plausible is this. Think of the sine as a polynomial with an infinite number of roots. Then this polynomial's degree must also be infinite. We only include odd powers of x because of the symmetry of the graph. Sine is point symmetric around the origin, therefore we only use those powers of x whose graphs have the same point symmetry. They look nothing like the sine function, but the as yet unknown coefficients will straighten them out. We make the same setup for the cosine, only now the graph is symmetric around the y-axis, therefore we only pick from the even powers of x, whose graphs all have the same mirror symmetry. The goal is now to find the coefficients in both series. Let's apply the idea of tiny changes to the powers of x as well. For example, the square of x plus h equals the square of x plus 2xh plus h squared, but as h becomes smaller and smaller, the main contribution comes from the two rectangles with area x times h that form the middle term. The term h squared vanishes faster in some precise mathematical sense, which I will not dive into here, and therefore we neglect it. The cube of x plus h can be thought of as the volume of, well, a cube whose width has grown slightly along all three axes. The main contribution to the increase in volume comes from the three slabs x squared h. There is a pattern here that continues into higher dimensions. The fourth power of x plus h, that is the volume of a slightly grown hypercube, equals x to the 4 plus contributions from four of its cubic sides, so 4x cubed h in total, plus again negligible terms. x plus h to the fifth is approximately x to the fifth plus 5x to the 4h, etc. For more detail and a more thorough explanation, check out chapter 3 in the amazing series Essence of Calculus by 3 Blue 1 Brown. All right. We can now see how a small nudge in h affects the power series. Sine of x plus h equals approximately sine of x plus these new terms. 
But we know what this change in the sign is from geometry. It is h times cosine of x. This means that the lower two series must be equal, whatever x is. Comparing the coefficients, we see that they differ by the constant factors 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. The power series of the cosine is in this manner determined by the series for the sine. That looks promising. Now remember that we also had a reverse formula for small changes in the cosine, so we can go the other way too. I'm leaving out the details here, but it works in exactly the same way. The only difference is that the factors now are the even numbers, and they each carry a negative sign since the change in the cosine was minus h times sine of x. And now look, your coefficients in both series are daisy chained by simple factors. The only thing left to do is to fill them out, starting in reverse order. The lower left coefficient is the cosine of 0, which is 1. Then we successively divide up by 1, then negative 2, then 3, then negative 4, then 5, and so on. The coefficients turn out to be the inverses of the factorials with alternating signs. Aren't these formulas two beauties? Yes, we've strayed quite far from the geometry of the circle here. And we will not really return to it either. The rest of the proof will rely on arithmetic and algebra with the occasional illustration, but the specific properties of the circle will no longer appear. But before I leave you, the series of sine and cosine have quite a nice geometric meaning. If you plot their terms as vectors in the unit circle, they form a rectangular spiral that closes in on the exact point with coordinates sine of x, cosine of x. There's a link in the doobly-doo to a Desmos page where you can play around with this. Our next goal will be to better spot irrational numbers so that we may find them in those series. The tool for that are continued fractions. See you then!